Welcome, creepers. Hi. Welcome to Creepy Conversations. I'm Gabby. Oh, That's Gabby. <laughs> and you want to introduce yourself? I'm Kalai. I hate it when I introduce myself because for some reason you froze. My pitch always goes Stop up so early on. You what? froze. Damn. Not now, government. I think they know our topic. That's why yeah. you're not doing this episode. Yeah. Speaking of, let's go straight right to it because this is going to be a long ass topic. I think it's going to be a two-parter. It is going to be a two-parter. It's going to be a lot, you guys. So let's get straight to it. This week's episode is about police brutality. For the first time, I didn't do a single research, like, for realsies. So, this one's gonna yeah. be on Kalai. Because Gabby was busy working on something <laughs> for you guys. So, yeah, let's go straight ahead. But, by the way, there's no way for us to discuss police brutality without getting political. And without, like, calling the government. <laughs> because, you know, there's no way. That's just it. But this isn't propaganda against, like, the current administration or any administration. These are just facts yeah. that are actually going through in our country. So, yeah. Oh, by the way, this is going to be, like, police brutality in the Philippines, specifically? Specifically the Philippines. Because if we cover other parts of the world, it's going to be, like, five fucking episodes. <laughs> but anyway... So, what's the situation of the police brutality in the Philippines for those who aren't from the Philippines? So, these issues have something to do with class. Like, if you look at different countries, that's also the same. Like, most likely if you're from the lower class or if you're poor, you'd most likely be a target of police brutality. And yeah, in the Philippines, it's the same thing. Poor people are more likely to get killed by the police. So, what is police brutality? So, I'm sure you guys know what it is. I think everyone knows the concept. It's obvious. <laughs> yeah, but let's just define it for those who just want it to be defined. <laughs> so that when we see it, we can report it. Because, you know, police brutality isn't just police beating up people. There's, like, a lot yeah. of different shit to it. So it's defined as a civil rights violation where officers exercise excessive force against a human, an individual. So this includes, but not limited to, obviously, this is fucking copy-paste. <laughs> it's like, we can tell. Physical and verbal harassment, physical or mental injury, property damage, and death. So even if it's not, like, what you see on the movies where police like beat up people police brutality can also be verbal like blackmail or yeah verbal or mind tricks like you know stuff like that so i don't think that's even something familiar for people because when we say police brutality we immediately think like an assault physically so i think that's mm. one thing that we always have to watch out that even if it's verbal it could still be police brutality in a way yeah and the thing also is that even if you're a criminal you're a known criminal the fact that your cops will like use excessive force on you that is already police brutality because their job is to serve and protect not to beat up and right. kill people so that's it. I did mention earlier that it's a social class issue, but that doesn't mean that if you're poor or if you're someone from the not someone from the lower class, you're safe. You know, there's such a thing as what our police actually call and it's disgusting how they just call it collateral damage, which is yep, you know, I mean that, that's not something that you're supposed to call a life. This is crazy, actually, because when they or we, whoever started that concept of collateral damage, people are becoming more okay to that concept, mm. which is totally wrong. It's disgusting. Exactly. By the way, this is true because in the death of like three-year-old Micah Olbina was killed when the police raided their house to capture her dad, she was shot because... According to the police, her dad used her as a shield, although according to her family, that wasn't the case. 
when interviewed, the police just said that she's just collateral damage. And when interviewed by the media, her mom, Maika Ulpina's mom, in tears and in anger, she said, my daughter is not just collateral damage. So you guys, we hear the term collateral damage often and we think, oh, because it's the police officers that's doing it, that's okay. But you have to think that these people have families, these people have dreams and aspirations to become somebody. And the police, because of excessive force, took that away from I them. I mean, if you were a cop, and say, for example, it was true that the dad, for some reason, used her as a shield, wouldn't you at least try to save her? De-escalate. Exactly. Dude, not even half an hour into this podcast, I am already triggered and I'm trying so hard to contain myself. <laughs> I gave Gabby the, the warning. Trigger warning. The trigger warning yesterday. I was like, be ready to get pissed because... I am pissed. Yeah, so that's it. This is why we should be against police brutality because you could literally just be in your car just walking down the street and a stray bullet can kill you or like police could be chasing someone and could hit you while they were doing the chase. And they wouldn't even care because you're just quote unquote collateral damage. Yeah. Exactly. So this is interesting because last June 11, 2020, just recently, presidential spokesperson Harry Roque was asked during a press conference if he thinks that there is a deep distrust in the policemen among the public. And his reply was, in the previous years, PNPs, which means Philippine National Police, trust rating is good. It even has a high trust rating. And he continues to say, you know, members of the opposition are reacting to several issues because they are still hoping that they would succeed in removing the president from the office. So they think that this is because of people being against their administration. No, this is against police brutality. If I were someone of power and I hear people complaining about the police, knowing that these people are unarmed and the police are armed, I would do an investigation on it right yeah that's the thing with people is they assume immediately and it's always like you're pro this or you're anti that when in fact it could like uh, oh my god it's not just black and white (laughs) it's not team edward or team jacob as i keep on saying so yeah ever since ecq or in the philippines it's called enhanced quarantine that's what we call our lockdown There have been reports by the media that there are police officers who are abusing sex workers, allowing them to pass checkpoints in exchange for sex. We mentioned this in the previous episode, kind of. Yeah. So on May 21, Rappler published an article on sex workers being abused by the police. So Mari Vick, not her real name, she asked her name to be changed. Her and her family were going hungry because they couldn't work because of quarantine. So... Because she has children and nephews to feed, Marie Vic decided that she didn't have any choice but to meet up with a married man who had been interested in her. But to get to him, she would need to walk several kilometers and get past a checkpoint and walk several kilometers more. So since she was desperate for, you know, money, because if you're hungry, you get I mean, desperate. like, you do what you have to do to make ends meet. It's not easy. Yes. Exactly. And she wasn't the only one who was getting hungry. Kids were getting hungry as well. So she walked several kilometers for two hours until she reached like a small tent with some police officers. And according to her, there was one of them who was like a familiar face. His name was Andres, which is his name is also changed because Marivik is not ready to go against these police officers because they are of power so he was one of the first policemen who gave her cash in exchange of sex when she was still a teenager so yeah she has known this police officer to have been giving and not just her other people from her town also so but before it was just cash and then it became just threats So he was known to be an abuser of sex workers in their town. And then during lockdown, he and other policemen would knock on sex workers' homes and 
they would what rape the them. F- exactly. <laughs> they were known to be constantly threatening women. And it just got worse during lockdown because everyone exactly. was inside their homes. No one there were there weren't any witnesses. So during this encounter of her trying to get through and dress would not let her pass unless she gave like have sex. him what she wanted yes which was sex for pass so because she had no choice because she was hungry she did what she had to do and according to her undress the police officer even drove her back to her house so he could rape her and even though it looks like she is willing because you know she agreed to it it is still rape because you're using you're your power into it it's like, uh, if yeah. you don't do this, then this will happen to you. Like, that's not how consent works, yes. people. That's not how consent works. So, yeah, she said it was extremely embarrassing for her, but she was really desperate at that time. And after the rape, Andres gave her a loaf of bread and 150 pesos and offered her a ride to get to her customer. That's not even enough to cover for the mental abuse this is causing like exactly i'm fuming right now i don't want to turn this podcast into a rant so i'm trying to hold myself together but like fuck man this makes me so angry yes it is and our anger is understandable because these are helpless people yeah you know i mean they're being taken advantage of i'm not even just saying this because i'm a woman and i feel for them it's because I'm human being and they are too. So we have to empathize like common decency. Exactly. He was taking advantage of the fact that she was a sex worker. You know, people, it doesn't mean that someone is a sex worker. You can degrade them. It, that's not how it works. You know, they're still human. And, you know, at least she's getting paid to get sex. Some of you just do it for free. <laughs> there, I said it. <laughs> So yeah, during a press con, again, presidential spokesperson Harry Rocke was asked about this, and his response was, we asked the PNP, and they said that there was no complaint. So he said that because there were seven people who kind of complained Mm -hmm. about it, so he said, so the seven alleged victims of sex for pass must come forward and file a complaint. The victims who fell prey to the sex for pass harassment may reach his office and the PNP Women and Children's Protection Office. If you're afraid, go to my office or, again, at the Women and Children's Desk, which is available in all police stations. So he, like, I find it crazy how he was just so easy to say last June 11 that there was high distrust, knowing well that there are people who are afraid to go against, go even make a complaint. It's so difficult to go against authority because in the first place, they would be the first person you want to trust because they're supposed to be there to protect you but they're doing the total opposite so it's like where do we go from here exactly who do we call ghostbusters (laughs) no one call ghostbusters people no i'm just kidding during the lockdown in the philippines just the lockdown From March until May, there were multiple cases of abuse by police officers. An example, on May 6, 2020, a video of factory worker Ronaldo Campo surfaced on the internet where he looked like he was laying down in the hospital and his face and both of his eyes were like swollen shut and he had bruises all over his face. In the video, he says he was arrested on May 12, 2020 with other curfew violators last Tuesday night and brought to the General Trias town plaza. And then Campo fell asleep after the violators were ordered to exercise as a form of penalty. So before he fell asleep, they were asked to do an exercise. They didn't really state what kind of exercise, but they were asked to do a form of exercise. So of course you get tired. And it was already nighttime. So he was awoken by policemen and another man, and he was brought to a dark area where he was allegedly beaten up. And because you get beaten up by police officers and you just woke up, the first thing you do is like run for your life. 
because you don't understand what's exactly. going on. You just fucking woke up. So he did the exact thing. He ran for his life and ended up in the house of an old man. Police cornered him and beat him up again until he lost consciousness. Next thing he knew, he woke up. He was already in the hospital. Where is this? In General Trias Town Plaza. I'm not even... Let me search where yeah, that I'm is. I'm not even going to comment because this... Like, fuck, man. Cavite. I can't even believe this is so like this was in happening everywhere, all around the world. Exactly. And the sad part is some countries don't even get heard. Like, people don't know that this is happening because for some reason it's not out in the media or there's just not enough coverage for this. Exactly. And Ronaldo Campo, his violation was violating the liquor ban and the curfew and having no quarantine pass in his So possession. they beat him up like the fuck? Yeah. Even if he did violate, there's no need for you to beat a man up. What's funny is that According to Colonel Marlon Santos, so he's the director of the Cavite Provincial Police, he said that Campo had accidentally slipped and bumped at a motorcycle parked near the station, and that's what caused the bruises and injuries on his face and arms. And he said that the suspect was brought back to the station, but he ran away and fell on the pavement twice before he finally jumped over a creek with like knee deep muddy how water. clumsy could you be for that to happen all in the same right? day like fuck man wait there's more so in that muddy water there were broken bottles and garbage which is another excuse why he has so many bruises all over his body and then he again climbed a concrete fence which was topped with barbed wire and went to the roof of the old man where he fell to the ground. While running towards the old man's house, allegedly, Ronaldo Campo grabbed a hostage who was supposedly armed with a long stick and struck him on the head several times. And because of that, the suspect moved again to the fence and jumped over the adjacent residential property and fell into the empty swimming pool where he was finally cornered and handcuffed by the chasing policeman. The suspect tried to escape again as he was being brought to the police station and this time he tripped on a rope this is getting installed so as a barrier. Ridiculous. Exactly. He tripped on a rope installed as a barrier as part of a lockdown measure. He, according to Santos, the head of the police in Calvite, or was he? <laughs> Let me check. He, the director of the Cavite Provincial Police, he tumbled down so hard, causing his chest and face to smash on the pavement. And on that circumstance, the suspect was not able to get up anymore. And immediately, the policemen, upon learning that the suspect obtained body injuries, they rushed the suspect to General Trias Medicare Hospital. Wow, so now they're like, saved him now. Yeah, Santos even said that the policemen exhibited good faith by bringing the suspect to the hospital for medical attention. I think they should change their careers from being police officers to script writers. Exactly! I was thinking of that. Like, this sounds like some cartoon script writers. This would be so funny. This is like a Tom and Jerry shit. Even Final Destination isn't that stupid. Exactly. They just got so imaginative at that whole story. They cannot even, like, say, sorry, we did beat him up. They just had to create that whole thing of him falling multiple times and having, like, the hostage and whatever, whatever. Like, really? These guys, these guys just will say anything just not to get accountability. So, yeah, time to get serious. Again, on April 4, 2020, a 63-year-old man... Juni Dungog Pinar was shot dead in Mindanao after threatening village officials and police with a scythe 
at a coronavirus checkpoint. The man was believed to be drunk when he threatened village officials and police manning the checkpoint in the town of Nasipit in the southern province of Agusandal Norte. The suspect was cautioned by the village health worker for not wearing a mask. And the suspect got angry, and then he said provoking words and eventually attacked the personnel with a scythe. And the suspect was shot dead by a police officer who was trying to pacify him. Pacify him with a bullet. It's always the easy way out for them, right? Like, I don't even have to de-escalate this. Like, I don't want to deal with it, so I'll just shoot you. And people are just like, yeah, he did a brave thing for shooting that man. That shouldn't be the case, people. So, local officials in Santa Cruz in Laguna province and just south of Manila admitted to locking up five youths inside a dog cage on March 20. Huh? Yep. The, the officials sought to justify their action by saying the youths have violated the curfew and had been verbally abusive. So you treat them like animals. Is that it? Yes. They put them inside a dog cage. That is so stupid. Like, whatever you're saying it's still not justifiable exactly you know you can just lock them inside a person's prison that would be enough trauma they sound like sociopaths you know how it's like i'm doing this because you didn't do well like i'm doing this for you kind of mentality yeah exactly that's not how shit works Come on. Officials forced curfew violators in Paranaque, which is also a different town. It's a city within Metro Manila to sit in the intense midday sun after their arrest. So they put them there because, according to the police officers, they had no place to hold them. So they put them right under the intense midday sun. What? That right there is police brutality because that's considered as torture. I just don't get why it's necessary. You know, if you don't have any place for them to stay, what you could do is give them community service, let them clean the towns. That's like a better... You're like benefiting. Your town is benefiting from it. And at the same time, they're learning from this whole thing. They're just feeding their sadistic ego. Like, to exactly. be honest, it's kind of like an authoritative thing. Like, I'm in control of this situation, and so I will do whatever the fuck I want with you. Exactly. That's not how it's supposed to work, because you're someone of power. You're not supposed to abuse that. And so I saved this one for last because this one... in infuriated me the most this also caused like a lot of backlash and a lot of kerfuffle on social media because there were like i love how you used kerfuffle reminds me of like <laughs> captain hulk brooklyn yeah. Nine-Nine. yeah <laughs> i learned that word from brooklyn 99 <laughs> but yeah this one um there were videos actually two videos that were released and there was a lot of debate regarding this whole issue So, Winston Ragos, who was suffering from schizophrenia and PTSD, which, by the way, one of the reasons that triggered his mental illness, according to his mother, was from being beaten up by his superiors while in training, you know, as a soldier. And also, aside from that, from what he went through while in duty... By the way, there were previous claims that he was a Marawi war veteran... So a bit of background, Marawi is actually a place in southern Philippines, and three years ago, I believe, like 2017, that place was captured by terrorists like the Mauti and the Abu Sayyaf group, and these guys were like affiliated to ISIS and Al-Qaeda respectively. So there was like a five-month-long war between these guys and the Philippine Armed Forces and the U.S. Navy. So, yeah. Yeah, that was the war in Marawi. And there were previous claims that he was a veteran of that war, but he wasn't. They eventually found out that he wasn't. According to his mom, he was already discharged from the military months before the siege in Marawi erupted. And... 
Also because the military found that he was no longer mentally stable to be able to serve as a soldier because he would space out. Like, he wasn't being violent or whatever. He would just, like, space right. out and wouldn't be able to do his duty anymore because he would just not function. He's just not there. Yeah, he's just not there. But according to his Winston Ragus' mother... When the Marawi siege began, even though he had already returned, he was in the same unit as those soldiers who eventually fought and died at the Marawi siege. So most of those soldiers were his friends. So he kind of had like a little bit of trauma because of that. Because, you know, if you. I mean, that's a lot. There's always that survivor's guilt, right? Yep. So yeah, he was officially flagged by the military as mentally ill. And he was allowed to have checkups at the Armed Forces of the Philippines Medical Center. So what happened was that because of like the whole thing, he was given medication and he was able to like be okay. Right. But what happened was that because he felt okay, he started skipping on his medicine. And that's always a thing. Yeah, that's a common thing if you have a mental illness. There are times that you feel like, not just here in the Philippines, it's all over the world, by the way, people, yeah. that you feel that you're okay and you don't need medication, so you stop taking them. Mm -hmm. By the way, if you're a person who's taking medication, don't stop, unless if it's advised by your doctor. So yeah. that's what happened to Winston. Because he felt that he was okay, he would spend the money to buy medicine to buy gasoline instead, and he would like drive around using his motorcycle. He all over the city. I thought you were going to start something about arson because when you said buy gasoline, I'm like, that's a weird thing to switch no. from with your medicine. <laughs> he just wanted to like walk around. He just wanted to like see people and see the city and right. just, you know, process things and feel the city. So that's what happened yeah. to him. But because of that, his situation like kind of got worse. So his mom decided to have Winston confined again, bringing him to the Veterans Memorial Medical Center on March 27. But that was already the time that the lockdown was happening because of COVID-19. The hospital could not take him in because they were already overwhelmed with COVID-19 patients. So they kind of like preferred to have people who weren't positive. For them, they preferred if they just stayed somewhere else. Because right. they might it contract, makes sense. yeah, which is like a normal thing to do. They were told that it was too risky that he could get infected because one of the things that he loves to do is like walk around. So the doctor gave them a week's worth of medicine, which they could not replenish because of the lockdown. So because of this, this worsened Winston's condition, but he was never violent, and again, he would just space out or just sing loudly and talk loudly basically but he was never like right. confrontational or whatever like even his neighbors the people around him even though they knew that he wasn't okay they were not afraid of him because they knew that he wasn't violent right what did he have again schizophrenia, schizophrenia and ptsd oh my god that's not a good combination exactly because he would sing alone and talk loudly he would like stand out in the crowd because he wasn't like yeah. everyone else. So according to his mother, he went out to buy cigarettes and coke with just a bottle of water and with a paper with his mother's contact number and address in his bag because he was known to like go around and then eventually get lost. So get lost, yeah, yeah. his mom knew to like put her contact number and their address in his bag which his mother handed to him right as Winston Ragos was about to leave his house. What happened next, we're not exactly sure of what the actual timeline was of what happened before the police officers started threatening him, but there were reports that he was stopped because he wasn't wearing a mask. Others say the police officers or one of the police officers saw him walking around and thought that he was acting suspiciously, aside from the fact that he wasn't wearing a mask. So whatever transpired before that, all we know, because of the video that was taken by one of the police officers, actually, that Winston Ragus in the video had his hands up 
he was arguing with the police officers and he was kind of uh, shouting like he wasn't holding anything like he was he was like basically saying what do you want from me like i'm not doing yeah. anything what do you want from me and you could actually hear witnesses around them because you know they were five They're police aware. officers versus this one dude wow that's a lot and they had their guns drawn so people were like looking at them immediately yeah immediately so people were shouting at the police officers they were saying he's harmless he's not like well. yeah he's harmless he's not armed he's just not right in the head he has a mental illness he is war shocked you know which is like the term in the philippines we say war shock for military people that PTSD yeah for PTSD so yeah but despite the warnings of the civilians and even though he had his hands up because he was turning his back from the police, he kind of got fed up. So he faced the police and was like, what do you want from me? And he put his hands in front of them and he said, I'm not holding anything. What do you want from me? Right. And whatever happened next is unclear. Some reports say that like one of the police officers, one of the five, said to throw his bag away because his bag was a sling bag. So they said, throw your bag away, like clear your whatever. Yeah. But in the video, Winston did reach for his bag and then they shot him. And then so... How the fuck do you throw your bag away without touching exactly. it? Exactly. And so he removed his bag. We're wizards now? Right. So he removed his bag and he was shot again. And then Winston threw his bag at the side before he collapsed. My heart. Yeah. Because honestly, even... Okay. Say he didn't get shot. But the fact that you are more shocked or like you have PTSD and you have people aiming guns at you. Exactly. Like that is so much trauma already. It's like you can't win with the situation. Exactly. They ask you to throw your bag away, but just as you reach to do what you're being told, you get shot. shot dead. Exactly. Like, fuck, man, what do you want from me? That's right. And also, another thing that's interesting was that despite the warnings of the civilians that he was mentally ill, you can hear one of the police officers say that they didn't care that he was mentally impaired. Like, they literally said that, that I don't care if he is mentally impaired. So, yeah, they were, like, ready to kill him. I'm fucking speechless. <laughs> you get speechless because of, like, the audacity of these people that are just... Like, idiots! Exactly. So, witnesses say that the police officers commanded the people not to approach the body. They did not perform first aid on Winston... They did not touch him, but instead what they did was they grabbed his bag, which was on the floor, and brought it to the police car. Now, that's... So they really wanted him to die. Exactly. That's sketchy to me, for them to grab his bag and bring it to the police car, because you don't touch the crime scene, especially without gloves, because that's tampering with the evidence. You wait... Y yes! You wait for the soko or the scene of the crime operatives to seal the whole thing. Your job as a police officer, if you see that this person does not need first aid anymore, your job is to just clear the crime scene. No one needs to touch it, but they touch the bag. They're probably going to frame him or something. That's right. They announced that they found a gun in the bag, which was not the case because the mom was like, he does not own a gun and everyone who knew him knew that he did not own a gun. And they all were like, he was harmless. He did not like guns. He did not own a gun. And the mom was like, I was the one who packed the bag right before he left. He even almost forgot the bag. I was the one who gave it to him. It was just a bottle of water that was inside. We do not own guns. Like, if you have PTSD, why the fuck would you have a gun in the first place? Exactly. And the reason for shooting him was like he was going against the rule of leaving their house for non-essential task, which is crazy. And they said... So you get shot yep. for that. And they said that they thought that he was reaching for a gun in his bag. That's why they shot him, which is, by the way, that's not the case. I'll tell you later on why... That's still considered as police brutality, even if you think that the person is about to shoot you. If I was a police officer and I think someone was about to shoot mm -mm. me, that still isn't cause for me to shoot them. 
you're supposed to be trained for this exactly de-escalate it's like they don't even know the word de-escalate if the creepers could actually see me right now i'm rolling my eyes so hard i can see my brain (laughs) seriously this is a thing that would make you roll your eyes in anger exactly the stupidity of it all and the audacity to even think that we will believe them for one second like we're not that stupid they think that we're stupid but we're not and if you believe in the police dude don't allow them to manipulate manipulate you you. i cannot even find words another thing (laughs) that the witnesses also say is that the police were quick to grab the witnesses taking videos of the whole incident and made them delete it or else they will confiscate their phones is that even allowed i don't think so that's like freedom of speech like that should go against an amendment or something i did not research on that sorry it's okay no but like the certain act of you coming up to people and saying delete the evidence of what happened today means that you understand what you did was wrong or something sketchy just took place exactly so i did research on it so according to the jurisprudence it demolishes the self-defense argument that the police gave that they shot him because he was reaching for something in his bag the supreme court stated that the mere thrusting of a hand into a pocket which may appear as if a weapon is about to be drawn does not amount to unlawful aggression the presence of which is a critical requirement for validity invoking self-defense in fact the court further ruled that even cocking of a rifle without aiming the gun at any target does not sufficiently establish that one's life is in imminent danger wow yep that's the law like you guys are police officers you guys don't know that shit like you should know this thing it is available on the internet and you're supposed to learn this in school like- exactly aren't you supposed to learn this on training but which makes sense because it doesn't mean that you're holding a gun you're already even if winston let's just say that he did have a gun in his bag which he didn't but let's just say excuse me mm-hmm. for argument's sake even if he was reaching in his bag to get the gun he could have been reaching for it to throw it aside You know what I mean? Yeah. Reaching for something doesn't equal to them retaliating. Like, you know what I mean? Exactly. You only open fire if they shoot at you first. Exactly. I was about to say that. Like, Right? Because your job is to serve and protect, not to guess if you're in imminent danger or not. This is why I hate people when they assume things right away. Like... You don't know the intention until it happens. Exactly. So, stop. Right. Another thing is that because he had mental illness, and yeah, let's say it did trigger him seeing like these armed people. And by the way, the police, they weren't wearing their normal police uniform, which is in our country in the Philippines is blue. They were wearing camouflage. Which, it kind of made them look like part of the military because during the lockdown in that area, the police were given the costume, not not costume, uniform. uniform. (laughs) So this is like Halloween now, like costume. Sorry, but they were given the uniform of like, like it kind of looked like they were part of the military, but they were actually just police. The police. But I mean, like, clowns wear costumes, so I guess it fits the bill. Yep, and because they're not military, so it's a fucking costume. (laughs) (laughs) But yeah. No, actually, this is very sad for especially those cops that are actually doing good. Like, they actually know what they're there for. They love their jobs. Because it's so unfair for them to be labeled and be generalized because these fucking idiots exist exactly but also if you're a good cop and you're listening right now quit your job man (laughs) (laughs) no i'm just kidding (laughs) what i'm saying is that if you see your fellow cop abusing their power don't be afraid to report it 
be the change that this country needs. Exactly. Especially from someone of power. We need that from you. Yeah, don't just stand there, you know. Yeah, even if you're a good cop, like, you arrest the right people and you don't violate or abuse your power, the fact that you just allow your fellow cops to brutalize other people makes you a bad cop. You're you're part of the cancer. Yep, exactly. Don't be a cancer, be a Libra. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just kidding. So yeah, you could say and defend the police and argue that there is no way that the police must have known that he had a mental health condition, even though the witnesses were saying that he was going through something. But let's just say the police did not know that he had a mental illness. It should be part of the system for officers to be able to detect mental illness and not shoot unarmed people. Like, de-escalation should be something that our police should practice, especially towards people who are going through, like, a mental breakdown. Yeah. No, but, like, even so, say, for example, he did not have an illness, I don't think it merited him getting shot. Like, what the fuck did he do to get shot? Exactly. There's no reason for anyone to get shot, even if they were armed. Unless they shot back at you, which is still not a reason to shoot people. Unless they were, like, literally hurting other people. They hit you. (laughs) No, I'm kidding. But yeah, this should be a wake-up call for, like, the PNP to train the police and, like, the field personnel to detect and deal with the people who are going through a mental health crisis or, like, going through something mentally Because, you know, we're so quick to say mental health matters, but we're also quick to side with cops who kill people who are going through a mental breakdown, you know? Yeah. We should change the system or add something to the system that will protect these people because there's no way for us to know that, oh, I'm going to, my brain's going to break today. You know, we can't stop that shit. I can really attest to that because I grew up to an aunt who was schizophrenic and she could get really violent when things kind of triggered her and she doesn't even know that it's happening, but she is... She was and she is the nicest person that I know. So it's like people just try to understand each other here. Yes, I agree. So yeah, another issue was that the policeman was allegedly heard as saying that he didn't care if Ragos was mentally impaired. So together with that fact that Ragos was also shot twice, even though the police claimed that he verbally assaulted the police officers, this particular statement of them saying that they didn't care means that they had premeditation and the intent to kill because they did not listen to the warnings of these people and they did not even try to de-escalate it so the court ruled that retaliation is not self-defense so meaning what they did to Winston Ragus was not self-defense so they can't even make a case of what happened to Ragus was in self-defense but instead it was premeditated murder because there were minutes of them before they shot him to decide whether they would de-escalate or not you know what i mean so eventually nbi deputy director fernand lavin commented to reporters on thursday june 4th 2020 that the bureau has filed complaints of murder perjury and planting evidence against Good. The main captain, which was his last name, was Florendo. Oh, by the way, NBI stands for National Bureau of Investigation. Yep. It's kind of like, is that like FBI here? I think so, because FBI stands for Federal Bureau of Investigation. (laughs) But for us, it's just national. So yeah, murder is a non bailable offense, by the way, so that's good. So aside from Florendo, who shot Winston Ragos, police trainees Joy Flaviano, Arnel Fontilias, Dante Fronda, and Delejes Gasiles are also sued for murder. Because they just watched their yeah. whatever co This could be like second Yeah. Second degree. Second degree or something. 
or third degree. I don't know what degree that means. Let us know if you guys know. <laughs> Educate us. We're open for education all the time. So Florendo and Staff Sergeant Hector Besebas, Bes, sorry, Hector Besas are sued for planting yeah, evidence. Yeah, murder their names. I don't care. <laughs> So this is also different to the complaints filed by the Quezon City Police District, who only sued Florendo, which was one of their own, for homicide, which is in Quezon City, is bailable. They did not file a complaint against Florendo for planting evidence, which is like, so you're okay with your cops planting evidence? Hmm. So, yeah. (laughs) I know some shit that I actually want to talk about, but... I really feel like this is gonna get my entire family in trouble. Like, I'm not too worried about myself, but my family's back in the Philippines, so I'm just gonna shut up about the things that I know. Yeah, let's not get your family in trouble. Mm, trouble, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, NBI wrote in its complaint. Never has homicide or murder been a function of law enforcement. The public peace is never predicament on the cost of human life. Yes. Next time practice what you preach in a statement on thursday (laughs) the philippine army welcomed the filing of the complaints and they said may this development be the first step of our quest for justice for ragos and his family through this we hope that we can at least honor his sacrifices to the nation he served and raise awareness to the mental health issues our soldiers face and that's it those are few of the police brutality issues our country faced during lockdown. It saddens me. Like, it honestly breaks my heart. Even if, say, people do find justice for the injustice that their loved ones have gone through. Because it can never bring back someone who has passed away. It's like, this is the least you can do for the fuck up that you did. And... That was completely avoidable. Yeah, it's so uncalled for. Exactly. Like, again, you don't need to shoot someone just because they were reaching for their bag. I brought this case up because and on social media, I even have family who I just want to punch because they sided with the police officers. They were literally like, oh, karma's on him because he did not follow rules. And I was like, really? Y'all don't even follow rules. And you have the audacity to just calmly say that? Like, so you're okay with abuse of power. I had to archive this certain group chat of me and my family because I could not take... It's just too much. Because it's like, wow, I know you guys and you're okay with these things? Like, this is why our country is just where it is right now zero progress because or maybe a little progress but still not enough because we're okay with people who abuse their power you know first they're just police officers they can run for senators they can run for president you know let's stop them while they're still stoppable like didn't your dad and uncle experienced police brutality before yeah my dad was in prison during the time why am i laughing (laughs) because this is a serious subject my brain's immediately like "Hmm, hmm, hmm." it's like oh my god (laughs) trying to protect myself no i'm just kidding but yeah my dad was a he was in prison during the time of marcos during the martial law because he was protesting because he had classmates that were being killed he was in college by the way he had classmates who were being killed for protesting against the government so he was like protesting goosebumps yeah he was protesting against police brutality basically and then they not just that but also they jailed him because his cousin my uncle was a writer Well, he was good at writing and he had like really great points against the regime, Marcus regime at that time. So they considered him as a terrorist. Yeah, they jailed my father because he was a cousin of my uncle. (laughs) That was one of the main reasons because they thought that he was in cahoots with his cousin. Right. right. And I have like, oh my God. I have three other uncles who went to prison during the time of martial law. 
and I had an uncle who was killed by the police and I don't know if it was the police by the way sorry but he was killed and what they did was when his body was on the ground the killer approached his body and placed the gun casing on top of his head and then walked away if you guys are as triggered as us please don't forget to subscribe rate and review on spotify and itunes because this shit is like yep out of this world exactly let us know how you feel we have another episode after this that is still about police brutality because we are not we are done. not dumb people <laughs> Because we were just talking about the police brutality during the lockup. Wait till you get to the police brutality outside of the lockdown. Before that. Before that. that. Yeah. So, yeah. Oh, my God. So, thanks for creeping, you fucking creeper. And remember to call out the cops who are abusing their power. <laughs> Bye. Bye.